this week on Arizona Illustrated, a refuge for injured wildlife. It pleases me greatly to see something return to the wild. This is what it's all about, getting these guys into the wild again. A look back at Annie Louse and her corner store. I like to do it. I meet people, I take care of them, they come in and talk to me. What would I do, sit home and look at television? I don't think so. A longer run at Frida's Garden. The Botanical Gardens is very lucky to get this exhibit. I read that it's only one of two in the whole country, so this is a real coup. And telescopes versus squirrels on Mount Graham from the vault. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. On the night of March 30th, a fire destroyed much of a local shelter that rehabilitates Sonoran desert animals. Over its two-decade history, thousands of creatures have been nursed back to health and then released under the direction of the founder, Janet Miller. Next, a 2015 profile of Ms. Miller and the center, Wildlife Rehabilitation in Northwest Tucson. This ranch-style house in Tucson is representative of many others in the city. It's a familiar sample of 20th century residential models, but if you venture inside, it is anything but commonplace. The property is home to a wildlife rehabilitation center, mostly birds or small mammals that have been injured or abandoned. Creatures that depend on helpful human hands for survival and recovery. For example, these two barn owls came in as orphans. Volunteer Alan Tasky is assisting with their care. They were brought in and parentless, and we started hand feeding them. They're perfectly healthy. They were too young uh, to be left alone. They weren't able to survive on their own. And uh, now they are mature enough, and they will be released within a two week period. A few yards away, another enclosure is home to a family of great horned owls. Luna lost one of her eyes when she was young and can't be released into the wild. She is used for education and outreach and as a foster mom to new generations that will return to the natural world. Mostly I'm in here with the songbirds and also with the bunnies. I really enjoy it. Sometimes I'm really tired when I get home. When you work here, you do just about everything. We do everything from laundry to dishes to skinning and chopping mice, food preparation, cleaning cages. It's never ending and it's never done. Are you doing bunnies? Who's doing bunnies? And it would not be possible without the direction, guidance, and determination of Janet Miller. Janet Miller and her husband, Lewis founded the center more than 20 years ago, but he passed away in 2010. He was able to uh, see the funny side of things and, and go with that. Um, and he cared about what we were doing. He was very interested, and he was a fine partner. So uh, it was a real loss as far as I was concerned. Still, she continues the operation thanks to a team of caring volunteers and veterinarians. That and her own endless efforts. Her work days are longer than those of millions of other people who are decades younger. My day is running about 18 hours. That's right, about 18 hours a day. This is not an office job or a store with a fixed schedule. The clients here are living, breathing animals that require round-the-clock care. Especially summer and spring. This is big baby season. Everybody wants to eat all the time. And they want to eat now, not later. Janet Miller organizes schedules. She trains volunteers, orders food, and mixes formulas. We all need heroes. I don't care how old we are. She is, she is a hero to me. She really, she really is. She's an amazing woman. Um, her knowledge, her patience, uh, her temperament, her love for animals, uh, she will be right up there 
with St. Francis. Somebody described you as a hero. A hero. Well, I don't know myself as a hero. I'm doing something, as I told you, that I wanted to do. I can't do it all now, but I've got people who can, and they do a good job. See you next See you. week. See you next week. Thanks. And when her team takes off for the night, Miller is at it again when necessary. The animals in her home depend on her, and Janet Miller delivers. It is a sentiment she has carried all her life, a love for animals and nature, a desire to alleviate and nurture. I think attitude towards this plays a tremendous role. In other words, I have to believe in what we're doing, and I have to care about what we're doing enough to say, hey, I've got to get up in the morning, <laughs> and I'm going to get up because I know I have something that needs to be done. There's four Kestrels, okay. two here and two down below. Miller informs her potential volunteers about this because there are setbacks and heartbreak, and the job is not for everyone. Some animals won't heal and cannot be released or be placed in a proper facility such as a zoo. They cannot be kept as pets, so sometimes they must be euthanized. However, success stories keep them going. A red-tailed hawk is getting a chance to test his wings. Flying around the aviary is great, but that's not going to tell me the whole story. It is called creance, flying him with a line attached to a leg so it can't get away. She's just uh, Steph, are you ready? All right, we're going to put him on the ground. We're going to see what he does. That's what he does. Whoa! This raptor is looking good and should be ready for the wild in a few days. Yeah, thumbs up. It pleases me greatly to see something return to the wild. This is what it's all about, getting these guys into the wild again. They look good to me. This is the most personally satisfying thing I've ever done. Um, these animals are beautiful. I learned so much about myself. Um, I get to care for animals who are frightened. Uh, they don't speak my language. Um, I don't speak their language. And if they can become healthy and get back into the natural sort of things out there, um, what better thing is there? I saw it. It's great. Animals are my passion especially the wildlife. They're the true innocence in the world. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very emotional. Well, she wants a worm, just a minute. That gives me great pleasure to see that happen. And I have to accept the fact that it can't happen. You can't do four and 500 animals a year and expect everything's gonna go okay, because it's not. But Janet Miller keeps on trying. She's absolutely amazing, and without her, this place would not exist. That's a fact. She's getting anxious. She's not sure how much longer she'll be able to keep it going, but as long as she has her health and can count on her extended family, she'll go back to her house, get up early in the morning, and work late into the night. 18 hours if necessary, she explains. The animals are counting on her. You can find out more about the center and its rebuilding efforts on their Facebook page at Owl's Well in Tucson. In 2014, we spent a day with Annie Laus as she operated her family's corner store, much the way she and her family had since 1956. Annie recently passed away. She was a cherished member of her community, 
So we'd like to share her story with you once more. When I was 11 years, I went to work for my dad. So I was r raised in the workforce. When my husband told me he was going to open a drugstore, I thought, yippee! <laughs> That's for me. Here comes the bus. My mom is absolutely a person that I can't find anywhere else in the community. At her age, still working in retail, six out of seven days, it's amazing to me. I don't know what the next one is because I can't see it. Get your uh, magnifying glass oh. out. I'm getting a little there. I need this thing. Oh, this is too big. I don't need this. I can see it. Today is the 10th, right? God, already is the 10th. My husband Roy graduated from the College of Pharmacy at the University of Arizona in 1952. He was a registered pharmacist and we did pharmacy for about 50 some odd years. He was kind of like the local doctor, the local pharmacist, and also got into uh, sundries and uh, beer and wine and spiritus liquor, so he had everything in one place. He used to take care of families, you know, the mothers would bring their kids in, they'd have a sore throat. Well, he knew what to do. Somebody would come in with pink eye and he knew what to do. I opened at 11 o'clock, usually, or maybe a little bit before. Close at 5, because I'm pretty pooped at 5. <laughs> do you have pricing on this uh, stuff, Mom? I didn't think when I was eight years old that I would last to nine working here at the store because I wanted to leave so badly because when my dad forced me as the oldest son to come and work here after school, I was so mad at him. Why would you do this to me? Now I'm 61 years old and I'm still here at the store. In this store, you can't sit down hardly at all and it passes fast, and I think life passes like that, fast. Um, you turn around and you're cold. We're looking at what this building was before we bought it, which was in 1956. The Shanghai Cafe, see, right there. And the prices are unbelievable. I was born and raised here, so was my husband. Tucson High, graduated from Tucson High and got kicked out of the University of Arizona. <laughs> but that's another story. I'm, I'm an old Tucson and I got sand in the blood. <laughs> I, never had, I never had the desire to move. Probably it means that I was so dumb that I couldn't move out of town. But maybe I didn't want to move out of town. Four ninety-nine. Four ninety-nine. Hmm. Let me add these groceries up real fast. Okay. You can come in anytime you want to and just ask for an item. And normally, when you don't see it, she'll have it somewhere else in inventory because she holds on to things like that. Where can you get these wallets again? You know, you cannot get these wallets anywhere else. These are like classic retro right here. It's just stuff that they don't make anymore, they don't sell anymore, but I keep it. Because you can't, you, there's no way in the world you could ever get it again. Volcanic oil, made for horses, but used by human beings. It used to sell like mad. You couldn't, you could keep it on the shelf. It's black and it smells like hell. <laughs> What's up, Annie? How are you? I'm good. It was Ailey's birthday yesterday. Oh, no kidding. Nine years old. Uh, isn't that crazy? Are you getting old? Huh? Here in this store, it's not just come in and buy what you want, but it's also find out how Annie's doing. And also, she spends a lot of time socializing with her customers. 
So she builds relationships with them. Makes sense now. You know, like, that, oh yeah, and that, and that's how this ties together, and all that stuff. So yeah. we found um, a good niche in this store that you met the people and you took care of the people, and we were very close, so I could take care of my children. It, it all worked out very good. My brother called me and told me that my dad had passed away, so I was, I was on I-10 and I kind of got choked up a little bit. I was, didn't know what to do. I mean, I hated to see him go, but I didn't want him to live like he was living. He passed away on my birthday, August 5th. Ah, you know, things go on. Um, it's tough to lose my dad. Although he was uh, pretty tough on, on me, it goes back to this whole thing of you become your dad and your dad becomes you. And you don't realize that sometimes until later on in life. You know, so when he went, it was kind of, I kind of felt like there was a piece of me that went too. Come on in, trying to catch the bus. I know what you're doing. Come on in. Just grab one. You guys know. Never mind. You're gonna make us miss the bus. Come on. Not going to miss the bus. How much are these? Nine nine seven dollars. The bus is here. Take up the line. Here. Here. Okay. Here. Here. Thank you. They think they're going to miss the bus. It comes back every five minutes. She has uh, such tenacity, such strength, such energy. She's a constant reminder of uh, what it takes to survive in life. Thank you, I Thank you. I love you. I know what? I love you too. I like to do it. What would I do? Sit home and look at television? I don't think so. I meet people, I take care of them, they come in and talk to me, and, and it's, it keeps you, it keeps you going. See ya. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. You'll also find stories from future programs, an easy way to submit your own story idea, an archive of past episodes of Arizona Illustrated. And you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona, azpm.org. Recently, a spokesperson for Tucson Botanical Gardens announced that they're extending their most popular exhibit ever, Frida Kahlo, Art, Garden, Life. It came to Tucson last year and now will be open through the end of August. We went for a visit back in November, just as they were adding the finishing touches to Frida's garden. A couple of years ago, I was at an American Public Garden conference meeting, and one of my colleagues, Karen Dobman, who's the vice president of exhibition for the New York Botanical Garden, mentioned to me that they were awaiting to hear about a grant award. And I said, about what? What kind of grant? And she said, well, we're going to mount a Frida Kahlo exhibit. And the minute I heard that, I thought, Tucson needs this. We hosted the exhibition May to uh, October 2015, and um, we had been working on it for three or four years in advance. We typically do several flower shows each year, and we have 250 acre garden, so the venues are spread out. And we were able to secure a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, but in order to get that, they really want the work that you put into an exhibition to live on. And so we immediately started looking for partners, and the Tucson Botanical Garden seemed to be a perfect fit. And I thought, I don't know how we're going to do this. But she said, so what parts of this exhibit do you want? And I said, I want everything, except the artwork we couldn't accept and a few historical items. I said, just pack it all up and ship it. We'll get it shipped. And Pima Community College was able to recreate it and rebuild it. 
and uh, it has just been a labor of love of the entire community partnering to make sure this happens. This is not only a celebration of Frida Kahlo as a Mexican, it's a celebration of Frida Kahlo as a universal human being. And more than that, celebration of the Mexican community that is working in the U.S., in Arizona, and in Tucson. So this is a great occasion. Oh, I think it's wonderful. It's the colors, the vibrancy, the blue, and the marigolds, the bright orange. And it's just so creative. It's fun. The Casa Azul is outside of Mexico City, so we in New York it was an internal ex exhibition with some outside aspects and then a gallery and poetry walk. So then translating that to Tucson was very exciting when I got the phone call that this was going to happen and you know my home, what I call my hometown and um, I'm from, grew up in Yuma but I've spent a lot of time in Tucson, went to school here. So when the New York Botanical Garden called me and said that this was happening and they knew I was going to be ecstatic about it is the way that I remember it in Mexico City originally, open to the sky. This is amazing and I'm thrilled to see all of the love and creation that the New York Botanical Garden put into this exhibition, living a longer life here in Tucson. I'm really interested in native plants and in gardens and I was very curious to see how they would, I was, what her garden looked like. I think that the Botanical Gardens is very lucky to get this exhibit. I read that it's only one of two in the whole country, so this is a real coup for the gardens. It's gorgeous and it is quite an insight into her life and, and what she's all about, which I didn't know too much about, so it's enlightening. Well, she's really the epitome of the cult of uh, personality. What made her special was not only her surrealist works that were very personal and quite challenging, but also her own style. She melded the idea of European modernism with Mexican indigenous culture. So a lot of her imagery comes from that uh, kind of sensibility and certainly her dress. But then later, the contemporary folk artists have been influenced by her. So you'll see a lot of Chicano artists or folk artists uh, emulating how she looked. Uh, for instance, we have this wonderful piece by Josefina Aguilar, who is a Oaxaca folk artist. And in our collection, we have a double-headed Frida. And again, it's sort of putting her on this special cult celebrity status of putting her on a pedestal for being kind of a champion of the folk artist from Mexico. And then we have another artist, David Teneo, who's a well-known uh, Chicano artist, a mural artist from this area. And he's often painted her image. And then I think when you go to see the, uh, the festivities around Dia de los Muertos, a lot of people will dress up as Frida. So she's become almost as uh, much of an icon as the Virgin of Guadalupe because it's such a recognizable image. We hope that people feel that same inspiration when they come here and they read about Frida Kahlo and how nature inspired her to do the work she did. We, I also hope that you know, it's difficult. Sometimes you always, as a botanical garden director, have to figure out ways to inspire people to become environmentalists, to become gardeners, to, be, to become appreciators of nature who might not otherwise walk into our doors. So this just gives us another opportunity to make a connection with someone who might not be a botanical garden aficionado or even an appreciator and show them all that we have to offer which is much, much more than even Frida Kahlo. There's a lot of many components in this wonderful urban garden in the middle of Tucson. In the 1980s, Mount Graham, east of Tucson, was chosen as a site for construction of several telescopes. Now, some people were concerned about the environmental impact and the increased traffic on the mountain's wildlife, specifically the red squirrel. And so it became telescopes versus squirrels from the vault. Well, I support the project completely. I think it's justified. But we must have credibility in the process or the university and the whole projects that are going up there, which include other telescopes, will be in jeopardy. 
The project is the construction of three telescopes on 8.6 acres on Emerald Peak in the Pinalea Mountains near Safford. This area is in the 2,000 acre critical habitat of a unique red squirrel species. Protection of this endangered squirrel is one of the main concerns addressed in biological studies of the region. We asked the GAO for a review, a study. They did that and they pointed out a problem with the biological study to justify the telescopes. The project right now is on hold uh, as they work out the details of this 30-day update. To us, a uh, 30-day study, 30-day review, sounds like a whitewash. All this furor stems from testimony by the United States General Accounting Office that the Fish and Wildlife Service used non-biological information in preparing the biological opinion for construction of the telescopes. The conclusion of the study was that there was no, no reason not to move forward, that with the mitigating measures the squirrel was not at risk. But environmentalists believe all of this is unnecessary. It's not about science. There are other sites. The site studies were quite complete. Over 280 mountains were surveyed. Mount Graham ranked number two. It has been also reviewed by the astronomy communities in Italy, West Germany, the Vatican, and at Ohio State, none of whom are going to invest millions of dollars in a crummy site. I firmly believe that this is a justifiable project and good not only for Graham County, but good for the mountain. And our presence there and our biology there is probably the squirrel's best hope for finding out what really is the problem that's with its, its population fluctuations and, 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 uh, and providing data that can be used to remediate the effects of, the, uh, of whatever the problems are. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, just 40 miles south of Tucson is one historic destination where workers are restoring the past for future generations to enjoy. The ranch is part of our history in Pima County. For more than a decade, thousands of veterans have returned home from war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Many found the return home to be a battle of its own. I couldn't believe what I had become. And we visit with Matt Rendon in his Midtown studio, the analog record producer behind some of Tucson's most interesting and important music. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week. <laughs>